Well, welcome everyone to the Herbert C. Kelman Seminar on uh, International Conflict, which um, as you know, is co-sponsored by the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs and the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. And um, thank you all for taking the time uh, to be here with us for this really fascinating discussion we're gonna have about science diplomacy. And I'm gonna introduce the speaker in a minute. Um, but I, I, I wanted to um, just explain that um, we will be recording this session today. So if you or some of your friends, uh, if you'd like to see it again, or maybe some of your friends have were not able to tune in right now, um, it'll be posted on the PON website in, in a few days. So you can just keep checking. Um, and we are, as I said, we're, we're really thrilled to have our speaker, um, Paul Berkman with us today to talk about something quite honestly, I didn't know about until we were introduced to our speaker, uh, Professor Berkman. And I'm, I'm just fascinated by, by what he's going to be sharing with us today. And I have a feeling you will be too. Uh, but before I go on, I do always, as always want to thank everyone who helped make this seminar possible. So thank you everybody behind the scenes. And um, this, this format is going to be slightly different from what we have done in the past. We're going to be, I'm going to be interviewing Paul Beck, uh, Berkman um, and because there's so much information that he has, we thought it would be um, digestible, uh, more digestible if we just had like a conversation about it all. And uh, so we're, we're going to experiment with that uh, this time. So I'll be interviewing Paul and um, we'll be going on for about 40 minutes and after which we're going to open it up to you, the, um, the audience. And if you would please put it in the, put your questions in the Q and A function. Um, and uh, what I'll do is I'll take the questions and present them to our presenter, to Paul, and, um, and we'll proceed that way. And I'm, I'll, let me just apologize in advance. We never get time for all of the questions, but we're go I'm gonna try to see if I can summarize them. In any case, uh, at the end of this session, we're gonna turn it over to uh, the managing director at PON, um, uh, Nicole Bryant, and she's gonna just update you on some of the next upcoming events uh, at PON. So um, I wanna, want to um, introduce our, our wonderful speaker, uh, who's gonna be talking about science diplomacy. Paul uh, Berkman is the founder of the Science Diplomacy Center in the United States and is a fellow of the International Science Council. Paul also is an associate director of science diplomacy in the Harvard MIT Public Disputes Program, as well as a fellow with the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, um, better known as UNITAR. He wintered in Antarctica on a scuba research expedition um, in 1981 he became a visiting professor at the University of California in Los Angeles the following year. And at the age of 23, he became this professor. In that same year, he began teaching about science diplomacy, which evolved into his textbook, science uh, that he wrote on science diplomacy. And let's see, he, well, my pages are a little bit missing here. He had, um, he celebrated the 50th anniversary of the 1959 Antarctica Treaty with the interests of science and the progress of all mankind. With the interests of science and the progress of all mankind. He convened the Antarctic Treaty Sum uh, Summit in Washington, DC in 2009. The summit led to a joint resolution adopted with unanimous consent in both houses of the US Congress, as well as the first book on science diplom diplomacy, but diplomacy published by the Smithsonian in Institute in um, 2011. Paul's work integrates research into action with inclusion and common interest building as elaborated in the uh, Springer book series, Informed Decision-Making for Sustainability. He's been honored with uh, awards in the United States, United Kingdom, Switzerland, Russian Federation, Norway, and on and on and on. 
Um, and he is, I can't believe it that we ever I got so lucky to have him here with us to talk about this fascinating uh, subject. Okay, Paul. Here Donna, we are. Wonderful. And welcome. And did you want to say something first? You, you said you wanted to um, acknowledge. I, I would. I would. I'm in in Falmouth in, in Massachusetts and in from Falmouth. I live on the unceded lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag, who are the traditional guardians of the associated ecosystems on land and in the surrounding sea. I respect indigenous peoples in the state, across the nation and around the world as traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old. I honor courageous indigenous leaders, past, present and future. Wonderful, thank you for that, Paul. Um, I wanna start by, first of all, I, I personally just wanna thank you for the remarkable work that you've done on this topic of science diplomacy. And uh, also thank you for taking the time to be with us because this is, I think this is one of these cutting edge topics um, and we're just thrilled to have you, the one of the founders of this whole movement, uh, to be here with us and to share the, the story behind it, how it all emerged, um, and where you are today. So why don't we just start by having you tell us the origins of the, the whole concept of science diplomacy. Take us back. Well, really, they began in, in a tide pool as a small boy with a swell shark, but jumping forward to Antarctica, when I was in my early 20s, I spent a year in Antarctica. And Antarctica is a, is a very fascinating place to be on Earth. It's a distant walk off the planet type of place. And during that year, I asked myself, why did the United States and the Soviet Union cooperate continuously in Antarctica and outer space throughout the Cold War? despite the animosities that isolated them everywhere else. And, and that question really is, has been a guiding question for the rest of my life. And the, the, the essence of the essence, the essence of the, of the journey has been trying to figure out what enabled cooperation in the face of conflict. And Initially, I thought it was science. The, there was an international geophysical year in 1957-58. Sputnik was launched during that period. The 1950s was a very interesting time. It was after the Second World War when humanity was introduced to nuclear weapons. And it was a time of building, of imagination as well. And that imagination brought us into space in the 1950s. And the concepts of rockets and, and ballistic missiles with nuclear weapons emerged in the after the Second World War. And in the 1950s, there was a, a race into space with the same rockets. And all of these steps that were taken in the 1950s led to the Antarctic Treaty in 1959. And the 1959 Antarctic Treaty was the first nuclear arms agreement in the world. So what enabled two superpower adversaries to create the first nuclear arms agreement in the world? And for a long time, I thought it was science all by itself, in the sense that science is a, a language that's independent of, of nation boundaries and, and cultures in a sense. It, there's a methodology with science, natural science, social science, and indigenous knowledge, all of which reveal patterns, trends, and processes that underscore decision-making. And so the, the, the observations that came from that winter in Antarctica have evolved across decades. But the idea, the question that was asked when I was in my early 20s, in a sense, is something to encourage I would say next generation leaders, that the insights and the questions and the passion that drives them in their youth will carry them across the rest of their lives. And you know, if there are messages to deliver from this, this, this uh, discussion, um, it's that follow your intuition, follow your passion as, and, and build in ways that are helpful to humanity. It is possible to speak with a language of hope. Um, you know, the journey from that winter across decades has enabled remarkable things to happen. I remember speaking to the entire NATO Maritime Com Command 
in Whitehall in an innocuous building, two rows of 50 admirals with the NATO Supreme Allied Commander at the edge of the other end of the table on, the, on a raised dais with two admirals in the middle for an hour and a half talking about the Arctic and the high north. Um, you know, the discussions that are involved as a passionate person that is trying to do good things for the world opens doors on a planetary scale. Okay. So, um, Paul, you, um, you know, you referred to the language of hope. And I think that uh, Herb Kelman, who is uh, probably listening here to your talk from a very peaceful place, uh, I think he would uh, be jumping up and down knowing that you have created a process that enables and promotes the language of hope because he was all about hope and possibility. That was one of the things he thought the third party, those of us doing this work, were supposed to be doing. We were supposed to be giving people hope when there was despair and fear and all the rest. So I just wonder if you could say a little bit more uh, tell us a little bit more about how you, uh, how you as a scientist, understand your approach as the language of hope. Well, sometimes analogies work. I'll try one out. Um, we're driving down the road. All of us, you know, have the ability to drive down the road, and our immediate circumstances are on the left and the right. We certainly have to be aware and address what's adjacent to us. But we also have to look at the red lights. That are in front of us. We have to imagine a maneuvering into the future. And the farther the, down the road we look, the safer we are as drivers. Those that are tailgating are in very precarious position all the time. And we also have to be aware of what's in our rear view mirror. You know, so that's there are continuum of urgencies, what's immediately adjacent to us, what's in front of us, and what's behind us. If we think in the context of the world we live in, uh, across a spectrum of na subnational, national, international jurisdictions, planetary scale. And we think about the security timescale, the risks of political, economic, cultural instability that are in the face of every government all of the time. But at the same time, we have responsibilities at a sustainability timescale to look across generations and to understand how to balance economic, environmental, societal issues across generations. And the observation is that it's not one end of the spectrum or the other. We have responsibilities across the entire spectrum. So we have the opportunity to consider time and space in this journey. And one of the observations is that the farther we look down the road, the, the better we are able to address events and circumstances that will happen in the future. And for example, the beginning of the pandemic, which was the last time I had the opportunity to speak with the program on negotiation, very first day of the uh, seminar series, I think at that time, the pandemic had an exponential rate of growth. There was one person who died in March of 2020, then went to 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000 to a million in the United States, unfortunately. That's exponential change. And if you think about it, exponential change is also happening at the time scale of years to decades. And we can see this with high technology, transistor, bits on a trans, chips on a transistor, over thousands to billions from the 60s to the present. And we can see also exponential change in terms of human population size. A billion people on earth in 19, in 1800, 2 billion in 1920, 8 billion this decade. And it, not coincidentally, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going up in perfect correlation with the rise of human population. These are changes that we have that require decision making, require decision making at local to global scales. How do we do this? How do we align the, the capacity to make decisions across time? Well, time is the bread and butter of science. And it's, it's the essence of the natural sciences, it's the essence of the social sciences and indigenous knowledge, all of which have their own methodologies, but they all characterize patterns, trends, and processes. And where we are in today is a transdisciplinary world where natural sciences, social sciences, and indigenous knowledge together 
are necessary for society to be resilient in the face of change at local to global scales. And so that's, in a sense, that type of thinking enabled development of theory. And the theory, in a sense, says that an informed decision operates across a continuum of urgencies. So that's a theory. An informed decision operates across a continuum of urgencies. With the theoretical framework, it becomes possible to do research on it, but it also becomes possible to develop methods and skills to train and to refine. And so in a sense, where we are as a world today in the 21st century, with capacity unprecedented to look backward in time, I mean, unrolling scrolls with amazing uh, visualization technologies that were burnt in, in ancient villages and communities, for example, the skills that we have to look backward in time are unparalleled today. And we have the challenge of looking forward. And the further forward we can look, the more resilient we will be as a world. Um, and it brings us at local to global scale questions, not the least of which are national questions. And this diplomacy um, that you're, you've proposed and that you have used, um, trying to imagine and trying to have these informed decisions that you talk about um, with the um, combination of, the, of, of science and social science and, and indigenous knowledge, what role does indigenous knowledge play in that theory building, Paul? We have a, a segment of the world, um, the cultures, the indigenous cultures that have generational perspective. And wherever generational perspective exists, it's special. It's special in terms of the resilience that was required to operate across generations. Um, it's special, it, like calendars to mark time. Um, so in that sense, the, the, the diversity and the, and the beauty of the world is in part, you know, part of its humanity, for sure. It's the rocks and the birds and the fish as well. It's all of us and a planetary scale. And, you know, we are as a world trying to figure this out. Um, and I would say part of it is, you know, to be hopeful is to put things in context and say, you know, it's okay. You know, we're all right. We're making progress. You know, you may not know it, but we're making progress. And the context is, you know, in a, in a sense, the progress, the distinction of where we are as a world. The 20th century was the first time in human history when we had world wars. They weren't regional wars. They weren't continental wars. They were world wars. And it was enabled by industrial capacities and advanced technologies. So, so there were some forever type of consequences that came out of the 20th century. But the reality in terms of context, the 20th century in relation to the oldest calendars on earth around 6,000 years old, 60 centuries, one century out of 60 is like one year out of a lifespan of 60 years. I mean, the reality is that we're just in our infancy as a globally interconnected civilization, you know, crying about it, making mistakes, bumping into each other. And the challenge, like any species, you know, there's a precarious feature of being an infant. But you hold an infant in your hand and you see the future. And this is where we are as a world. And to imagine how we evolve on a planetary scale with eight or 10 billion people, you know, limited resources working together to survive, to enrich our cultures and to, to imagine things that will take us into space, which is a accelerating in itself in terms of exploration. These are imaginations. And for me, you know, speaking of space, the 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 inspiration in, of all of this is is thinking about Jules Verne. In, in the in 1865, he wrote a book from the Earth to the Moon. A hundred years later, man, humankind was on the moon. You know, and that, you know, that imagination, what was called science fiction for better part of a century becomes science reality. You know, when I was a kid, Dick Tracy had a watch on his arm that he could speak into. Now you have Apple watches people can speak into, for example. I mean, it's amazing. You know, if you think it, you can build it. 
And that's the imagination. So if you can think a world that works toward hope and recognizes the choice that begins at any negotiation to start from a position of conflict or to start from a position of conf common interest, which is why the United States and the Soviet Union were able to cooperate continuously in Antarctica and outer space. They started from a position of common interest. And common interest is a choice, like a glass that's half full or half empty. At the beginning of any negotiation or resetting any negotiation, there's an opportunity to choose between conflict or common interest. And the choice will determine the journey. Ultimately, if it's successful to promote cooperation and prevent conflict, but starting with common interests and conflict determines a different journey. And so Paul, I, I just wanna pause on that notion because we are um, in the midst of uh, well, conflict as a growth industry now. There's conflict everywhere. There's conflict, not just um, international conflicts or global conflicts, but there's conflicts within our domestic society here, conflicts within people, internal conflicts. I mean, how do we, how, I mean, we've almost, have we crossed the Rubicon and forgotten about common interests? Or how do we take ourselves back to that decision-making point that you've you've so beautifully uh, discussed? How do we go back there and say, we choose, we are going to choose now our shared common interest. It seems like there's got to be a process there that takes us from this explosive dynamic conflict environment that we're all living in to that. And if you could address that, what would that transition look like? So I, I remember convening the first formal dialogue between NATO and Russia regarding security in the Arctic. It was in 2010, NATO Advanced Research Workshop. I was at the University of Cambridge, colleagues at Imgimo University in, in Moscow. We convened the first formal dialogue, involved nation, 17 nations at the level of ambassador, ministers, um, indigenous leaders uh, talking about security, environmental security in the Arctic Ocean. And years afterward, I asked myself, how does an individual bring together two superpower adversaries? Um, you know, clearly, there was nothing I could tell any of them about what they should do. And so you ask about diplomacy. And the diplomacy is actually really simple. It's not complicated. It's, it's it, the, simple, the simplicity is that anything I say to you is without advocacy. And to be more explicit, you can use or ignore anything I say to you in terms of an option. So an option without advocacy that can be used or ignored explicitly is different than a recommendation, which may or may not have agendas associated with it. And the agendas, whether they exist or they don't exist or perceived, they create a political dynamic. And politics, unfortunately, drains resources and significant waste of time. And so the sense of being able to contribute to dialogues, to decision-making in a way that is seen as helpful involves diplomacy. And the diplomacy, in my observation, is it's just a bit matter of being candid. I mean, in this discussion, all of the decision makers that are listening, you know, it would be presumptuous for me to re recommend anything. You know, I don't know. I've not been requested. But I can be helpful by introducing options without advocacy that can be used or ignored explicitly. And an option is to recognize that the beginning of any negotiation is a choice. To, make, to start the negotiation from position of conflict or to start the negotiation from position of common interest. Now, that's an observation. To actually operationalize that observation, the simplicity is to start with questions. If you start with, in an inclusive way, who, what, when, where, why, and how, if you start with questions, you can engage dialogue. And at the, at the end of the day, Common interests don't emerge just out of the blue. They emerge because of dialogue. And the steps in this are relatively simple. Again, start with questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And if you get to questions of common concern, you've made progress.
So, Paul, you uh, co-directed that first dialogue, as you just mentioned, between NATO um, and the West. And how could you just give us um, an example of how that who, what, why, where, and when? Could you just like walk us through what a, a discussion might have looked like with the framing that you're describing? So the the questions of the of the uh, Arctic Ocean in particular are of uh, ex ex extreme uh, value to consider for the future of humankind in all kinds of ways. And the concept of security, um, the observations of superpowers adjacent to each other, the, the concept of mutually assured destruction, um, all of those elements before the dialogues of climate really became apparent. You know, sea ice minimums were just being recognized at that point. Um, the dynamics of the Arctic was very sensitive and it remains in that sense, very sensitive um, and fundamental to how we address global problems. And so in thinking about the, the, the Arctic Ocean and, and thinking about common interests, the law of the sea, so we're diplomats. Diplomats deal with legal things, legal framing. So the law of the sea was the framework that we were working with. And the observation was that the central Arctic Ocean, high seas, was unambiguously a region beyond national jurisdictions, beyond sovereign jurisdictions. The questions about the sea floor, extension of continental shelves, that's ambiguous. But there was no ambiguity about the superjacent waters in the central Arctic Ocean high seas. And as a consequence, it was possible to look at that as an international space, which is where I began in the night when I, when I was early, early 20s, was thinking about regions beyond sovereign jurisdictions, Antarctica, outer yeah. space, the deep sea, yeah, and high seas. And the central Arctic Ocean high seas became a, a way to look at the Arctic Ocean. In a sense, there was humanity in the middle looking outward and on the other hand, there was the surrounding nations looking inward in terms of national interests. And the analog, in a sense, is the world. Hmm. You know, we have on a planetary scale, 30% of the earth is falls within the boundaries of nations, which collectively can be characterized in terms of national interests. The remaining 70%, including Antarctica, the deep sea, and, and the high seas, as well as outer space, as international spaces, are seen in terms of common interests. Mm -hmm. And so the framing, in a sense, of how we survive as a world, one Earth, is to see a balance between national interests and common interests. And so that observation became the early framing of science diplomacy, that the, that the, the, the challenge, the goal, was to balance national interests and common interests, ultimately for the benefit of all on Earth across generations. And the methods into that were international, they were transdisciplinary, and they were inclusive. So it was a process. So, you know, Paul, I'm listening to you, and I'm thinking, uh, as a psychologist, I'm thinking, we're talking about um, the evolution of consciousness on one level. We're, you're asking us, uh, rightly so, to think of things that are even beyond our own immediate interests, whether it's national interests or whatever the self-interest unit of analysis is. But um, I, boy, I can tell you from my experience, it is so hard to make those transform, uh, that transformation from one level of consciousness where you're so nationally focused or so self-interested to that broader, human interest, that humankind, as you meant, you use that word often, we want to look at humanity's interest here. I just, I, I, I would love it if you could share with us um, a story about how you saw that in action with that summit that you convened. Could you actually see people making a conscious shift in their awareness of something greater than themselves? So talk about a different summit. So last year I had the honor truly and, and good fortune to coordinate the Global Indigenous Youth Summit on Climate Change. Um, and 
It was hosted by the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, which one of the benefits of working with the United Nations, for sure, is that the United Nations can operate on a global scale with inclusion, whereas nations are compromised by their geopolitics. But so to be inclusive on a planetary scale required the involvement of the United Nations. And the Global Indigenous Youth Summit was by, for, and among Indigenous youth with global inclusion. So clearly I'm not Indigenous and I'm not youth. <laughs> um, so the, the challenge was to find an Indigenous youth leader, somebody that would, would rise to the occasion and, and you know, be a champion, truly, you know, a hero. And I was serendipity. I was invited to be in a mentor, mentee, mentee mentor program through the Science Advice Skills Development Program with the International Network of Government Science Advice in Africa. And they paired me with a wonderful woman, Dr. Temotope Sogbanmu from, from um, Nigeria. And Tope, Nigeria is an interesting country in itself. It has over 500 languages. You know, so if you think that each a culture is represented by its language, you know, 500 cultures, indigenous cultures in one country, for example, you know, tremendous richness. And so Tope took on board the leadership of this, this journey. And within a matter of weeks, really, Africa came on board, North, East, West, South, Central Africa, indigenous youth leaders. And these are, these are professors. These are well-trained individuals, uh, Global Young Academy, uh, leaders and 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 such, and they began to work in in Africa, and then it moved to Asia, and then to Europe and South America and North America and the Arctic, and and the within a year, uh, by the time we had the Global Indigenous Youth Summit on on climate change on the 9th of August, two thousand twenty three, the International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples, there were over one hundred and twelve nations represented across 88 languages. And it wasn't because there was a great deal of resources that went into this. It was in a matter of in, inspiring and, and, and enabling the imagination and, and leadership of, of indigenous youth by, for, and among. And one of the things that they produced, which is truly a legacy feature in itself, is a commentary in nature that indigenous youth must be at the forefront of climate diplomacy. And so if we think about climate, you know, on a planetary scale, it's a it's a forever type of problem. Humanity has always and will always have to address climate change on a planetary scale, you know, local scales, weather, planetary scale, climate. And planetary scale, the indigenous youth recognize that the depth of their cultures, the depth of their insights about responding with resilience in the face of change across generations is central to how we address climate change on a planetary scale. And so they're rightfully identifying that they should be at the forefront of this ongoing forever type of challenge. It, it, it's the, uh, the, the circumstance, unfortunately, is continuing. So future Earth will host the the Global Indigenous Youth Summit again on the International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples on the 9th of August, 2024. And this is a journey. Um, you know, like like lots of things, if we look for answers, we're probably not doing the right thing. I think the, the guidance comes from questions. Okay, Paul, um, I want to go back to something that you said earlier, which I think would be enormously useful um, to the people uh, in the audience who are doing conflict resolution work worldwide. There's you know, people uh, certainly um, here at, at Harvard uh, who are really engaged in a lot of, a lot of uh, reconciliation and trying to bring an end to these conflicts. You have said that um, when these uh, mess uh, messages or this approach that you use, if it could be uh, presented to every negotiation, the start of every negotiation, I mean, I'm just sort of paraphrasing what you said, if we could do that and to show that um, inclusivity can build common interests to help resolve these conflicts, 
what what really practical advice would you give to people in our audience today to how do you start that conversation at the beginning of a negotiation? Is that in itself a negotiation, trying to shift from conflict to shared interest or common interest? So, how, how do you introduce it? So, so to, to start, one observation in, and I've had the opportunity to train probably, I don't know, somewhere between one and two dozen um, foreign ministries through their diplomatic academies and institutes in terms of thinking about science diplomacy and informed decision making. And an observation is that the, the, the choice isn't necessarily apparent, that they have the choice to start a negotiation or position of conflict or from the position of common interest. So as a as a as a matter of course, conflict resolution becomes the guiding path in terms of skills development. And so the skill to initiate a dialogue about common interests is a question. Hmm. You know, it's not complicated. You know, I understand negotiators and, and at various positions go into dialogues with preparation and with instructions about things that they should and shouldn't say. But a question itself doesn't carry any obligation with it. It, it may be revealing in terms of interests but a question facilitates a dialogue. And at the okay, end of the so, day- oh, that, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, at the end of the day, one of the things that's significantly lacking in the world today is dialogue among allies and adversaries alike. Hmm. Well, Herb Kelman would, uh, I think, have uh, set the stage for those dialogues. I think he and uh, uh, all of his, um, you know, all of the people who studied with him, I think we would agree with you 100%. Dialogue is the way. I just wonder what, the, and I'm sorry to keep pressing you because I, I just, I personally want practical answers to this. You know, what is, give me an example of a question. Let's say we're working on a conflict in the Sahel region of Africa. Let's just say that. What would you, what question or what questions would you lead that that dialogue with? I think at the end of the day, the reason the United States and the Soviet Union were able to think in terms of common interests, the umbrella that they saw was in, in view of survival. Oh. And I think at the end of the day, even in the most precarious of positions, questions of survival remain a common interest. And, you know, it's at that level on a planetary scale where yeah. leaders of nations are challenged to talk with each other about questions of survival. You know, climate certainly is a question of survival. And, you know, the, the conference of the parties that came out of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, they have met continuously yes. in terms of discussing climate as a common concern. And I think the, the the survival, I would say, is the if you can ask questions about survival, um, you know, then you're touching the essence of a problem that everybody has to deal with at all stages of our life. Okay. You know, it's it's that's where the training is. It's a K through twelve. You know, not just at the level of ministries and universities. It's a K through twelve fundamentally. I think where the answers will come not today in future generations and if you know you said earlier about your psychologist background um you know the sense of of out of body experience in a, in a sense if humanity can project that the leadership is next generation then we're always going to be looking forward and the challenge right now is the leadership is stuck in you know trying to cement something in when the solutions that we're looking for will operate across generations mm -hmm. and in a, in a practical way you know the, there's a scalability to these types of thinking it, it, the idea of an informed decision as illustrated it's on either side of you when you're driving your car that's at a personal level the security to sustainability time scales it is a planetary level it, this uh, it, an observation about the solutions that we need as a world is that they're scalable. They operate from a person to a planet. You know, things like 
war on terror and everything else, they're not going to be solved by weapons of mass destruction or weapons in general. They're going to be solved by ideas that replace bad ideas with better ones. They, they will be solved by solutions that empower people to survive yeah. and to even thrive. And, you know, if we have that imagination, maybe like Jules Verne, we'll look 100 years into the future and we'll be able to realize it. Okay. Well, I can't believe it, but it's um, 40 minutes have passed, Paul. Uh, and thank you so much. Uh, right at this moment, we're going to try to engage some of the questions that we have uh, from the audience. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at one here about indigenous knowledge that I, I'd like to... Um, share with you. How can indigenous knowledge become appropriately respected when indigenous people's governance structures are not respected by local, national, and even international non-indigenous governance structures? What do you do with that? Well, it's, you know, the, the question is the at the heart of colonial and decolonial type of discourse. The colonization of great powers um, through history, um, the displacement of peoples as a consequence. Um, you know, that's that, you know, perhaps it's just a course of evolution that that happens. But with superpowers in the world today, that type of approach is no longer appropriate. And um, the colonial, decolonial thinking, you know, the power structures that exist in the world are changing because of the ability for all of us to talk with each other, you know, social media and, and so on. So, you know, I mentioned timescales and then there's also minutes to months in terms of social media. So the challenge in a sense is exactly that. It's, it's discourse, it's the dialogue that's necessary. Okay, um, thank you for that. We, um, there's so many questions here, but I, uh, this, uh, I think, um, is a, is a good question. If we think of former existential threats to society, like nuclear weapons and COVID, as unifying forces toward global cooperation, why is it that the greatest existential threat, global environmental change, has been so hard to harness towards international cooperation? We've seen over 40 years of denial, procrastination, finger pointing, and fractionalization. Is this simply the tragedy of the commons? Well, again, I think, you know, the, the time components like an accordion. Um, so in 1882, after the Little Ice Age in Europe had uh, compromised the health and well welfare of Europe, little bubonic plague, wheat prices went down. European countries said, well, you know, the ice that comes from the polar regions, we should think about this in terms of larger scale issues. So they were talking about weather at the time we talk about a climate today, but in 1882, the concept of climate change began and in terms of, of an experiment. And so that was tied to the sun solar cycle, 1882, 1932, 1957, 58, the International Geophysical Year, 2007, 2008, there'll be another one in 2032. In terms of these questions about change and time, you know, we are evolving in terms of our ability to observe the earth. And the questions that we're asking are changing as a consequence of our observation ability, analytical ability. And it's gonna change vastly with artificial intelligence for sure. It's, 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 a, it's a questions on steroids in a sense, and Socrates would be delighted, I'm sure. Um, so, you know, the context of the questions. And again, to frame the question, that's part of the observation about science diplomacy. It's a language of hope. How to frame questions that engage dialogues. If I say to you that you cannot do something, uh, you're not able to do something. Um, you know, I've stopped the dialogue. And the concept of not is, is difficult to pull out of a vocabulary. But if, if the objective is to facilitate dialogue, the doors have to be open and to facilitate that with, in a sense, easiest with questions because mm -hmm. it allows the discourse to flow naturally. 
Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, here's a short question. Any advice on how to balance toward or away from motivation when it comes to establishing common interests? So the answer again is across time. So short to long term. So, you know, the reality of operating across a continuum of urgencies means to be vigilant and aware of things that are happening at a security time scale. But at the same time, to be aware of the changes that are necessary to operate at a sustainability time scale. And it's not one end of the spectrum or the other. And so, in a sense, the, the answer involves looking forward and backward in time to understand how a common interest would apply and to think about the ancillary questions, the who, what, when, where, why, and how, that allow you to be inclusive in terms of thinking about operating across time. But the challenge, you know, in a sense, if we have an informed decision, by definition operates across a continuum of urgencies, we also have definition of an uninformed decision that only operates at a moment in time. So for example, something that only happens at a security time scale and isn't considered beyond that is by definition an uninformed decision. And, and not to not to jump into 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 discussions that perhaps are are more problematic, but for me the and I've written it the the, the poster child of an uninformed decision is when a president of the United States in a rose garden speech about trade with China decides to walk out of the World Health Organization in the middle of a pandemic. You know, it, clearly that had no long term benefit or welfare of the United States in that moment. It was a political decision only for that moment. That's an uninformed decision. So being able to characterize how information is used, the time frame becomes important. And if decisions are only made at a political time scale, it's like tailgating. We're going to run into the next car in front of us. And the challenge is to look further down the road, not one end of the spectrum or the other, but the entire spectrum constantly. Well, you know, I keep thinking about what that rose garden example that you um, that you just gave. I think, you know, what do you do with a leadership that isn't interested in looking down the road? How do you how do you develop those informed um, decisions, and how do you develop the skills that are necessary in order to make those informed decisions when the leadership is not even vaguely interested in that? Well, part of part of um, being a science diplomat is being brave. And so being brave to, in my mind is speaking to power. Speaking. So anytime I have these types of questions, I imagine somebody's listening. And so in a sense, the 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 um, ask your question again. Well, I'm just thinking about leadership, not not on any one in particular, leaders in particular, but it seems to me that they hold the lion's share of that kind of decision making, which projects you into considering the future rather than, you know, some narrow self-interest. How do you how do you get people in leadership positions to actually recognize that that is where the decision making needs to emanate from? from that future forward looking? How, how do you deal with somebody who doesn't care a bit about that a kind of informed decision? That was I my look question. At the, I would look at the leader himself. I would look at the, the, the leadership that's being provided. And in a sense, you know, promoting cooperation, preventing conflict are two sides of the coin. The two sides of the coin in terms of leadership are by fear and by hope. And I would say to a significant extent, the world today is being led by leaders who champion fear. And you know, the solutions to the, the problems that we face are clearly in, in view of dialogues, inclusive dialogues. They're not in terms of the fear that exists with exclusion. And the challenge in a sense and the observation, historical observation is that systems and processes that are choose to be exclusive, they fail. Yeah. And, and in a sense, the, 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 to talk about leadership and talk about leaders, it's a matter of thinking in terms of fear or hope. 
And I, I would say the leaders that that deal with hope are the ones that are the, the most cherished in human history. And the fewest, and they, there aren't that many around even in, in, in history to look uh, in as you know the champions of hope rather than fear. I'm gonna move on to another question because I, I think we could be stuck on that one um, forever. But uh, Cheryl wants to know what role does capitalism play in the current situation and what steps can be taken to change our systems to change the power held by those who are looking to grow their profits to the disadvantage of the people of the and the planet so you know why is science diplomacy accelerating i just came back from european commission meetings in europe last week why is science diplomacy accelerating around the world and Part of it is that the need for science diplomats that have an understanding of patterns, trends, and processes by different methods, natural science, social science, indigenous knowledge. But why are they needed? It's because of connections that involve business and governments at all scales. Um, there was a, uh, Denmark had a, a tech ambassador in Silicon Valley, country, nation of Denmark, sent an ambassador to Silicon Valley, which clearly reveals that ambassador is now at Microsoft, but the relationship of, in, of industries and how they operate with governments is part of foreign policy. It's part of international relations. The, the, the interests that are expressed among these diverse stakeholders, the challenges are how to discuss them, how to build synergies, rather than to simply think in terms of control and competition. Yeah. Well, um, we got we have several more. Let me let me just uh, go down the list here, uh, Paul, and see if how many we can get through before we we have to end. Um, as a matter here, here's the, the next question. As a matter of negotiation practice, how is it possible to cause someone to believe that common interests, if that person is committed to an ideology, um, that it's the only truth. So common interests evolve. They, they evolve because of dialogue. Um, and so the question is how to facilitate dialogue. And, you know, in a sense, hope and fear, inclusion, exclusion. So and an inclusive way to facilitate dialogue is with questions and not suppositions and not answers, but questions. And this is, this is hard. It's not easy. Um, but the, the, uh, the, the skill that the, the challenge here is how do we build relationships? Um, you yeah. know, it's, it's taking an interest in somebody else and the answers they would provide as well. I mean, enjoying the food and the, 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 the music of different cultures, and, you know, even though the languages may be opaque, you know, these are ways to understand and develop relationships. And at the end of the day, you know, as a, as a civilization, we're just people, 8 billion of us, but we're just people. And the challenges we have are just to talk with each other and to work out our problems and move forward, ultimately to survive. For ourselves and for our children our grandchildren but to survive the best we can and you know for me oh, my please go ahead. go ahead sorry please no finish your thought i, I finished well i was just because you keep mentioning survival and i think that's right i think that's a wonderful way of focusing um with common interest but what if my survival is dependent on the non-survival of somebody else. You know, what if in their notion, again, this is why an evolution of consciousness, I believe, is, is at the core of your science diplomacy because survival can mean, all right, I've got to get rid of these people next to me if I'm going to survive. Well, you know, part of, part of survival is short to long term. So there's a survival beyond ourselves. So this beyond your consciousness component, you know, the things that that reveal who we are as people, you know, what our what our priorities are. And, you know, and that relates to how we treat our fellow humans and others, animals and rocks and everything else. Um, you know, how how we work through life with respect and and 
you know, try to learn and grow as individuals, you know, be helpful in the world. It, all of those questions influence decisions that we make. And, you know, if it's a matter of me or, or something else, you know, what is it, what is the alternative I'm not looking for, looking at, you know, where are the options? And if you think about it at that level, you know, the person asked about options, consider yourself a nation. Now nations have a bushel of options they would call national interests. And that bushel of options, they can, you know, pick and choose and they can move them around as they see fit. Imagine a nation has another bushel of options called common interests. Now the nation has more options that they can use in terms of operating into the future. Well, those common interests don't exist unless they're built. And how are they going to be built is with science diplomacy. And so in a sense, the ability for nations to enhance their survival capacity involves a combination of national interest and common interests. And how do you build common interests across cultures and languages? You look for methods that are common and science provides methods that are common across the natural sciences, in terms of experiments and controls in different fields, it's across the social sciences in terms of economics and history and indigenous knowledge as well in terms of their ability to res reside and res be resilient in different in uh, lands around the world. So, yes. <laughs> well, I think um, you you made me feel better uh, in, in answering my question, which was what if survival uh, um, means one thing to one group and another thing? And I, I love the way you answered it that by saying there's short-term and there's long-term survival. I think getting us uh, to look up and out and forward um, is really a huge challenge that I think science can, can help us with. I'm 100% convinced you're right about this. The problem is there's a lot of misinformation out there about science. You know, science is being challenged in so many ways. So just in, by way of wrapping this up, how do you, how do you um, protect the integrity of science? when it's being challenged? Well, I think the science has always been challenged and it, you know, rightfully so. Um, it's, you know, part of how we make decisions. It's an important element in our world. Um, it, and it's been challenged continuously through time, you know, in different ways, you know, pilloried people and so on and so forth. Um, so, but there's a there's a level of truth in 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 understanding change, you know, and it's that pursuit with with standardized methods that becomes important, and those methods evolve over time and they're improved. Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, again, I go back to children. I think you know that the answers are with children, and. The children, you know, they drop things and they break things and they squish things and they burn things and they drown things. And it's not because they're malicious. It's because they're curious. What happens if I do this? Mm -hmm. And somehow in our world, if we could enhance that curiosity, that's innate. I think we would set in motion processes that are far more inclusive, adaptive in terms of change in the world. I don't think it's an either or. I think all of us together are in this, all eight billion of us. Um, Paul, we're going to have to leave it at that, even though um, it's there's so many more, so many more questions here that we didn't get to. And I want to thank our audience for for um, for all of the wonderful and insightful questions. And now I'm going to turn it over to um, Nicole Bryant, who is going to. Um, describe some of the upcoming events that are taking place at PON now. And again, thank you so much, Paul, and thank you everyone for attending. It's thank this you, Donna. Been fascinating. It's been fascinating. An and honor, truly an honor. Thank you, Donna. Thank you to you both for a wonderful uh, conversation. It's been really fascinating listening to it and uh, and as ever learning a lot. Um, we uh, are pleased to put on a series of events throughout the semester. So you'll see a couple of our upcoming ones um, uh, starting with our next event in just a week. So we look forward to seeing you here uh, for another live event or at a different
uh, in-person event through one of our programs. So thank you uh, to Paul Arthur Berkman and to Donna Hicks, of course, for this wonderful discussion. And uh, thank you to everyone joining in from around the world. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.